Hello and welcome back to my workshop for another of Harry's jetty training videos. In this video, I'm delighted to present to you Dave McQueenie's fantastic Lua application of Google Maps on your jetty transmitter screen. This shows how far you can push a Lua app and is a wonderful showcase for the capabilities of the jetty system. What can this app do? Let's set the emulator running. It just gives you something to look at. It puts a map of your airfield on the screen of your transmitter with a little symbol of a plane that shows the location of your model on the map as it flies around. You can get it to leave a tracking ribbon showing the path of your flight. You can color code the track for some telemetry parameter such as the receiver A values or Q values or height. You can set up no-fly zones with spoken warnings of approaching, entering and leaving the no-fly zones. You can set up GPS triangle racing for gliders, suitable even for a small foam glider, with fully spoken steering directions around the race and calculation of your laps and points. Although the app does look wonderful on screen, it's designed to give you all the information that you need spoken to you, so that you do not have to take your eyes off the model. You don't even need the map to be on the screen. You can have other telemetry screens showing and you will still get all the spoken instructions and warnings. Then you can look at the screen with its data after you have landed. I should point out that we cannot be responsible for your safe and prudent use of the app. This code is open source and free, released under the MIT license, and we cannot assume any responsibility or liability for its use. It's always the responsibility of the pilot in command to ensure safe operation of the model. Here's a short video taken at the airfield demonstrating no-fly zones in action. The app warns first about approaching a no-fly zone, then warns that the model has entered the zone, then after I turn the model back, the app tells me that it has left the no-fly zone. You can see on the transmitter screen that the aeroplane symbol turns from yellow to red, but the important thing is the spoken information. I never take my eyes off the model. OK, this is demonstration of the no-fly zones warnings using a glider. No-fly ahead. So that's the warning the no-fly zone's coming up. Warning, no-fly zone. And that, along with the stick shaker, if you have it, was a warning of the no-fly zone. I'm in it now, so I'll turn around 180 degrees and it'll tell me I'm coming out of the no-fly zone. Leaving no-fly zone. There we go. And next, I have a short video of the GPS triangle racing in action. Again, uh, the video shows, or tries to show, the transmitter screen but it's the voice prompts that take you around the race. My golden rule is never take my eyes off the model. Everything I need to know is spoken to me. Okay, I'm just going to motor the glider around the triangle uh, so you can hear the, the information that we're being given. In a moment, I'll switch on the triangle racing and it'll start by telling us speed and height as we head towards the start gate. Obviously speed and height are important because there's a limit to them. Uh, once we pass the start gate it'll tell us. It'll tell us if we've got any penalty points. Just need a bit of power up now. And it'll start giving us left right directions to steer and the distance to the pylon. And it'll tell us about the pylon tell us to the next one and when we complete a lap it will tell us okay so I'll get myself down from the starting point and I'll switch the system on ready to start alt 376 speed 40 alt 383 Start with penalty over max altitude. Penalty points 416, dis 112, left 23, dis 51. Okay, it's switched to giving a steering direction. Next pylon 2. 
left 147 this 256 okay so at the left pilot, 19 it told us to turn to the next 168 one. left 48 this 67 next pylon 3 that means turn left 48 this 213 left 33 this 135 this is short for distance left 23 this 64 next pylon 1 left 91 this 304 so we're coming back up the uh, left 11 Start line, as it were. Disc 243. Right, 18. Disc 100. Flap complete. And there we go. So that's a left lap completed. 26. Disc 77. I'd like for me to attempt to take off. Yep. Left, 91. Disc 73. Next pylon, 2. Left, 35. Disc 217. Disc 77. Next pylon, 3 left, 100. Okay. Disc 202. I'll switch it off there. You heard a moment ago there was a beep followed by disc and the distance. The reason for the beep rather than a left right steer is that you were within a few degrees of the correct heading. So rather than trying to get you to steer left or right just three or four degrees, it just goes beep, meaning stay on the direction you're going, and then of course it tells you the distance. The no-fly zone warnings are becoming very important. At most of the airfields that I fly at, there are no-fly zones either because of noise problems or because of some safety issue. Being given a warning of approach and then a warning that you have entered a no-fly zone is a big benefit. Also, when other flyers have complained to me that I'm in the no-fly zone, I've been able to prove immediately that I am not by showing them the screen with the live map with the model symbol and the ribbon tracks and no-fly zones marked on it. The GPS triangle racing section of the app is not recognised for the official GPS triangle racing competitions. But what it does do is allow you to have the fun of racing without having to buy or borrow the expensive electronic equipment or top competition gliders. You can adjust the size of triangle and time of the race to suit your glider, even a little foamy, and race against yourself by trying to get better scores as you become more experienced. Perhaps you'll enjoy it enough and then move on to the equipment required for the official racing. In this video, I'm not going to teach you anything about GPS triangle racing. You need to research that yourself. I will show you how to set up the app to do it. Dave developed the basis of this app long ago, and I suggested adding the GPS triangle racing. I've been using the app on my transmitter since the summer of 2020. And as I make this video, it's now autumn 2021. The main delay in making the app available to you has been making a system that makes it easy for you to get the maps and set up the no-fly zones and GPS triangle racing circuit without you having to write computer files with all their attendant error problems and without you having to set up a billing account with Google. For this, we have to say a massive thank you to Dave's son, who is not a model flyer but has given a lot of his free time to create a map generating website application that makes it easy for you to generate the maps you need and writes the computer files for you. Also, during this intervening year, Dave has continued to refine the program a lot and added more and more great features to it. I've been test flying the app all this time in gliders and in jets and in propeller models, finding the software bugs, trying new ideas and finding which ideas work and which do not. We are sure that you will love this app. If you find any bugs, do let us know in the comments below. If you have ideas that you would like to see included in the app, also let us know in the comments below. But this app already includes routines that restrict it automatically to prevent it from using the maximum lure resource that Jetty allows. So adding any more features may not be easy. 
the app limits itself to 80% of the Lua resource to leave some room for other Lua apps on your transmitter. So here is a plea to Jetty to please build in much larger processor and memory resources for Lua apps in future transmitter designs. Give us the resources, Jetty, and we will use them. The minimum requirements for this app are a Jetty transmitter with a colour screen. It must be updated to at least version 5 firmware. The app does not work with version 4 firmware. And the model needs a GPS sensor that works with Jetty telemetry. We've tested it with Jetty MGPS, with the RC Thoughts Homemade GPS, with the Powerbox GPS, and the Elite Systems GPS sensor. And as far as we know, it will work with any other brand of GPS sensor that Jetty can use. There is much to learn, of course, with such a capable app, so I have split the training into three videos. This video shows you how to get the basic maps and the app, and how to set up the model tracking. Episode 2 will show you how to create and manage no-fly zones. Episode 3 will show you how to create and manage the GPS triangle racing. You are wondering, how do we get a Google map on the transmitter screen? When the transmitter does not have an internet connection and the transmitter cannot run either Android apps or a web browser to view Google Maps. The trick is to use Google Static Maps. These are a fixed view, like a screenshot, but it's not just a screenshot photo. It is a genuine Google Map with data such as latitude and longitude that we need for placing the model using the coordinates from the GPS. You get the maps for the places where you fly and load them onto the transmitter. When you switch on your radio and your GPS sends data to your transmitter, the app can read your location and checks for a map that matches where you actually are. If it finds a map, it will display it. By using static maps of different magnifications, we can zoom in and out. The map on the screen will start at the closest magnification and it will automatically zoom out a level if your model goes off an edge of the map being displayed. OK, let's go and get our first map and the app. I will show you how to get a map for one airfield, then how to get maps for many airfields, and then how to get multiple maps for the same airfield. And then we'll look at how to set up the options in the application on your transmitter. Open your web browser and go to this address, www.jetilua.dfm.app. The DFM is Dave's initials. And this is what should come up. This is a landing page for uh, Dave's apps. The first one uh, being used here is the Maps one. So you can use, click here to open it. Opens up the Map Generator. I suggest that the first map you get is not a model airfield, but your home. That way you can test that your system is working rather than get to the airfield and then find that it's not working. Don't forget that you normally need to be outside for the GPS receiver to work. This large pane here is the area that you will get a map for. To get to where you want, you can pan around and zoom in the usual way or use something like Google Maps in another tab to get exact coordinates and paste them in here. So for example, we can zoom out a bit and move. I'll zoom all the way out. Just to show you, come across to my little neck of the woods and zoom back in. Or, as I said, you can go to Google Maps, right click, click on the uh, coordinates that come up and paste them in here. And it will jump to it. So put your home roughly in the middle of the map. then press the 
button called New Field at Map Center. This one over here at the top left. There we are. Now you must add a name and a short name. The short name can be letters and numbers only, no spaces or other characters, and then press the Save button. So we'll edit, call it Home. Short name can be the same thing. In this case, Home and Save. Now, Scroll all the way down and press this button here at the bottom left, Save All to File. This should immediately cause a file to be downloaded to your PC. You can see on mine with Windows 10, it's showing along the bottom bar. But if it's not like this, then go to your File Manager download location and check that it is there. You may not need this file for a very long time, but one day you will need the latest version of it. It contains all of your airfield data, so in effect it's your backup of your data on the website. The website should recognise your computer when you come back to it any time and show all the maps that you've created. But if it does not recognize your computer or you get a new computer or you've gone off to use a different computer for a little while, use the choose file button down at the bottom here and load in that file that you've just got. There it is there. And that will load up your latest backup file. Always do a save all to file after you've finished making any changes to your fields. Now, press the Create Jetty Repository button, this one down here. A pop-up box appears with a website address. Highlight and copy this address. It is unique to you. Also, note that it's time limited, but it will last an hour or more. Now, this website address contains your maps and the app itself and the computer files for the app to recognize your airfields. Along with the Save All to File button, you need to do this after completing any changes to your maps so that the repository has all your latest data. You will see a drop down box offering you the release version. Or the development version. Do not choose the development version. It's there so that I and others can test and debug future updates. They're in development because they're being tested for the bugs which stop them from working or crash the app, and you do not want that hassle. Now open Jetty Studio. Go to File, Configuration, Click on the Apps Sources tab, come down here and select a new line. Go to the end of the last one and press Return. And now paste in that address we've just taken. There we are. Say OK. The good news is that as long as you keep using the same computer, the map creation website should keep recognizing your computer and always give you the same repository address every time you amend your maps or want to download any updates to the app. So you should only need to do this copy and paste step the first time. If you change computer or do a severe clean out of temporary files and things, then the repository address might change. If so, then just do the copy paste step again. Now, connect your transmitter to the computer. If the transmitter wizard does not start automatically, then start it manually. And select the Lua App Manager. Scroll down the list to DFM Maps. Note that if you already have an app source for the other DFM apps, then the Maps app may not be with them. It might be showing separately. 
because it's using a different website address. There it is at the bottom. Highlight the DFM Maps app and press the Install button. And that's it. Whatever maps you've created and the app are now on your transmitter, ready for use. Disconnect the transmitter from the computer. Load a model that you want to use with the app and go to Applications, User Applications, press plus, select the DFM Maps. That's it. Go to Timer Sensors, Display Telemetry, plus, this time Lua, DFM Maps Overhead View. As with all Lua Maps, you need to add the app to each individual model that you want to use the app. Now you have everything in place to view your first map at home. So let's go out to the garden, dodge the rain showers, with a receiver and a GPS sensor, and let's see if it works. OK, switch on the radio, change to the map view on the home screen, and wait for the GPS sensor to work out where it is. Map view will not come on screen until the GPS sensor sends coordinates to the transmitter, and that can sometimes take a bit of a wait, much longer than this one's taken. If you're concerned that nothing's happening, go into sensors and logging to see if the coordinates have arrived from the GPS. Now the coordinates have arrived, a short message appeared on the screen to say that a field had been found, and it's displayed on screen. The aeroplane symbol is where you are sitting, and that's it. The system works. Let's look at getting several airfields and how to align the maps with the rectangular shape of the transmitter screen. Open the website again. You can see the landing page is updated. Click here to open the map generator. Or you could simply uh, bookmark this page, go straight to it. The computer should be recognised and show all of your existing maps. This is the home map we made earlier. Scroll the map or use the coordinates box down here to go to a model airfield. I suggest you use coordinates for the middle of the runway or put it in the centre of the field and then press the new field at map centre button. I'm going to do it this way by going to Google Maps, choose my centre point, click on there, right click, take those coordinates, come back here and paste them in. Press return, wait for it to update. Okay, it looks like nothing has changed because that big red marker is still in the middle, but that's showing the active airfield we're working on over here, which is the home field. If we scroll in, or zoom in, I should say, we'll find it has gone to those coordinates that I just gave it. So now we press the new field at map center button. Now we can go up and edit the name and short name and press save. Save it. Now, rotate the map picture to match the rectangle of the transmitter screen. Many model airfields have the pilot's box on one side of the runway and only allow flying out in front of that. So having a map that shows behind you on the transmitter screen is wasting the limited available view. Also, the flying is sometimes further out to the sides than the distance flown out in front. Therefore, realigning the map view to the transmitter screen can be useful. That's where the boundary rectangle can be used to change the orientation of the map. This shaded box is the boundary rectangle. Use the mouse to move this slider here, the heading slider, or click on the slider 
and use the left right arrow buttons on your keyboard to rotate the boundary rectangle. The edge that starts at the top, this one here, is what will be at the top of the screen on your transmitter, and you can rotate it clockwise from there all the way around. The panel on the left, this one here, shows you how it will look on your transmitter screen. I rotate the box to align with the runway I will be using, which is this runway here. The pilot's box is at that end, and we fly out there. So I want to rotate this edge to line up with the runway. I can't go anti-clockwise, but I can go clockwise. So if I click on there, and I'll use the left right arrow keys, watch the box rotate as I'm pressing the right key. I'll get it to about the correct orientation there, and then watch this box catch up. There we are. That is now showing what is in there, and this would be the view on your transmitter screen. I'll bring it back a little bit. There, I think that's it lined up. Now, press this Edit Clip Boxes button. This brings up a window that shows you the seven different zoom level maps that will be sent to your transmitter. The app on your transmitter will start by displaying the closest zoom. That's this one, zoom 17. And if the model moves outside any edge, the app will move out to the next zoom level, this one, and so on. A second scroll bar has appeared on the right of the screen over here for you to move this up and down. Start with the top one, called Zoom 17. You can use these movement buttons to move the view up and down the window or left and right. I want the map view to be useful to you, keeping as much as possible out in front of you and not wasting the view on the area behind you where you're standing. So I'm going to move up in the view because pilots will be standing here. Everything around here is no flying because all the flying has to be done out on this bit. So there's no point in me having a transmitter screen taken up with a view I can't use. Okay, I'll put it about there. Now, when you're happy with that, press the Align Bottoms button and all other six views will move up or down to the same bottom edge, saving you having to do that for all seven views separately. So watch the others. I press the button, and there they go. They've all now aligned to the same amount. Now we can close the clip boxes window. You could add a runway here, if you wish. It will show as a yellow box on the transmitter's view. I do not bother. The Jetty transmitter screen is small, so I do not add any more clutter to it. That has completed that airfield. Now scroll the map or use the coordinates box to move to another airfield and press the new field at Map Center button. I'm going to use Maps once again to find me a spot. I'll pick that, click on there, come back to the generator and paste them in. There we go. Now press the new field at Map Center button because the system still thinks it's at Abingdon. Now we've got a new field. We can edit it. Save it. Now this airfield is used for glider aerotow meetings. Although it has a runway, which you can see down there in the grass, and a pilot's box, which would be facing out this way, flying is not restricted to being in front of that. The gliders are allowed to roam all over looking for thermals. And this gives me two differences to that last field of Abingdon that we've just created. Firstly, there's no need to rotate the map view to align with the runway. I can leave it with north at the top. And the second difference is in editing the clip boxes. In the closest zoom, 
I'm going to put the pilot's box at the center, which will be about there. Pilots are usually standing around here. I'll go up a little bit. There, that's usually where I'll be standing. And because we're going to be flying all over the sky, this time I'm going to align the centers of all the other clips to this one, not the bottom. So press align centers and all other views have moved to match. And that's that one done. Now, finally, I'm going to make a second map of an existing airfield. Let's go back to Abingdon. The reason for this is that sometimes we use this other runway, the north-south runway here. And I want a map view to make the most of that. So firstly, I'm going to edit the name and short name of the existing one to be different between each map. I'm going to edit it. Call it Abingdon 1, short name Abbey 1, save that. Now, even though we're already on this field, press the new field at map center. Come up here and edit this one. So this will be Abingdon 2. Save it. And now I'm going to rotate the boundary rectangle to the other runway. When we use the other runway, the pilots stand here facing out this way. So I want the top edge here to be rotated round to face out that way. Off we go. Now I did this by using the mouse to click on the heading bar, but I like using the left right buttons on the keyboard. I find them a finer control. And there we are, the view that would be shown on the transmitter screen. That runway there is now aligned along here. So edit the clip boxes. Adjust the top zoom, and if I'm standing here, I'd like that to be in the middle, but at the bottom, so that all the view is out in front of me. So first of all, I'll move the view up. To there. Move it, or move me to the left, as it were. And then align bottoms. There, they've all gone to that. There we go. Now, when I switch on the radio at this field, the app will find that two sets of maps match the GPS coordinates. The app will pick the first one in the list, which is Abbey 1. If I want to use the other map, I can use an option in the transmitter's app settings to then manually select the Abingdon 2 map instead of the automatic choice of Abingdon 1. Clever, eh? Now that we've finished creating our airfields, what must we always do? Press the Save All to File button. Download that. That's our latest backup. Now press Create a Jetty Repository. The website address that comes up should be exactly the same as the ones it gave you last time. So now we can open Jetty Studio. Go straight to the Lua App Manager because that repository name is the name that's already in the list of app sources. And we can upload the latest maps. Scroll down to our DFM maps. Here we are. Click on it. Now, highlight the app and notice that Jetty does not have an update button. You have to uninstall first. And then, with it still selected, you can install from fresh. 
the repository contains not only your maps, but all of the app files too. So you'll automatically get any software update for the app. You now have your airfield and the app on your transmitter. So go ahead and add the app into any models that have a GPS sensor and in which you want to use the app. Now, the more maps that you add, of course, the longer it takes simply to load them into your transmitter. I think I've got about uh, 12 or 15 airfields or variations of them, so it does take quite a while to upload uh, once I've got my full set running. It's nearly there. dum de dum de dum Time for a nice Italian espresso and a chocolate biscuit. And there we go. Now let's look at the basic settings. These are individual to each model that has the app. They are not a global across all your models. So go to Applications, GPS Maps, Telemetry Sensors. In here it lists which parameter from the GPS is being used for each thing in the app. The app automatically senses many brands of GPS and fills these in for you, but it's worth checking that they are filled in, and filled in correctly. If the app has not recognised your sensor, simply use the drop-down boxes to fill them in. The altitude and speed only matter if you're using triangle racing part of the app, but having the latitude and longitude is mandatory. Next, look at flight history. This is where you control the ribbon track on the screen showing the path your model has taken. You do not have to show the ribbon, but it is interesting. Please take note, the ribbon shown on the transmitter screen will remain if you switch off the receiver, but once you've switched off the transmitter, you cannot get that ribbon back on the transmitter screen. If you want to see it again, you need to use the map in Jetty Studio with your log telemetry. The app defaults to not showing the track. The ribbon is made by joining up dots called samples. The first option decides how often your position will be sampled. It is in milliseconds and the default is 1000 milliseconds. In other words, one second between each position sample or dot. The next box is the number of samples to be put on the screen. The default is zero. In other words, no ribbon track will be shown. The maximum is 600. 600 dots, one second apart, means a ribbon of 600 seconds, or 10 minutes. The limit of 600 is because drawing the maps and the ribbon track uses a lot of the transmitter's Lua resources. But anyway, once there's too much ribbon on that little screen, it all gels into one big blob and much of the information is lost in that blob. 10 minutes is enough for most powered model flights. If you fly for long enough to reach sample number 601, the app drops sample number 1. At sample 602, the app drops sample 2, and so on. So you always get the last 600 samples, or the last whatever number you have set in that box. I find that a sample time of 1000 microseconds, or 1 second, works well with powered models. But I turn it up to 2000 microseconds, or which is two seconds between samples, for my gliders that fly slowly. And in theory, that gives me the last 1,200 seconds or 20 minutes of ribbon on screen. The minimum history distance to new point is the distance in meters. Oops, not that one. There, this one. Is the distance in meters that the model must have moved for a new point to be counted and displayed, regardless of the history sample time. This is very clever programming by Dave. It means that a hovering model, or a model sitting stationary on the ground after landing, before you've switched off the radio, is not using up its limited supply of sample points, overlaying them on top of each other, and thus deleting ribbon from the early part of the actual flying. The default is 3 metres, shown here, and I've never felt a need to change it. You can assign a switch to toggle the ribbon track on and off the screen. Select a switch and the position from the drop-down boxes. Why not use the normal method of moving a switch to select it? In Lua, that method does not survive an update. 
So every time you uninstall and install to get more or edited maps, the switch selection gets blanked out. Use this drop-down me box method does survive. Jetty has been asked to improve its Lua interface to let switch selection survive. The ribbon track color source uh, allows you to color code the ribbon for some other parameter, like you can do in Jetty Studio. Most useful ones I find are the Q values and the A values. Laps lets you make each lap of a GPS triangle race show as a different color. You don't have to choose one. The color lets you assign a switch to make the ribbon increment by one color in case you want to manually mark some events during a flight. View color gradient shows you the sequence of colors that are applied to a colored ribbon. Back to the main menu. Map browser lets you see all the airfields that you have created. There are different zoom levels and any no-fly zones or triangle races that you have created, which would be explained in episodes two and three. You select a field from here and press the show button. Now, using the up and down arrow buttons, you can zoom out the various zoom levels or zoom in. And if we'd created any no-fly zones, they would show up as a red boundary. And if there was a GPS triangle racing uh, set up, it would show the GPS triangle there as well. Manual field selection allow, lets you choose another map for the same airfield. Remember that I made two for Abingdon. If I'm actually at Abingdon and I switch on the radio, the app will choose Abingdon 1. And if I want to use the other runway, then with the radio actually running and having chosen Abingdon 1, I would come in here and choose Abingdon 2. And that's it. You now have the information about how to get the maps, install the app, and set up a ribbon track of the model. In episode 2, we will look at creating and using no-fly zones. A link to that episode should be in the top left of your computer screen now, so click on that and I'll see you there. But before you do that, why not click on the subscribe link at the bottom left of the screen so it's easier to find my channel in the future and see any updates.